This is Stop the Choppa Choppa, a simple first-person game with DSi-inspired graphics about protecting a pineapple from an ever-increasing onslaught of robots. It took me 10 months to complete, the longest I've spent developing any game. Development of this game was a rocky road with a lot of ups and downs that I'd like to share with you. Last summer, I made the first version of Stop the Choppa Choppa in one week for a game jam. I touted it one of my best games to date, but the game had been drastically simplified from my original vision, one that included more levels, enemies, options, and that kind of thing. But such is the way of life in game jams, I had to put those thoughts aside and move on. Come October, I challenged myself to spend 100 hours learning the Godot game engine, and decided that remaking this game would greatly benefit my understanding of its workflow and systems. A one-button menu, a single arena, two enemy types, and an ever-increasing swarm. This was the original game. My goal was simply to recreate this game as is within Godot. And I wanted to make it right. Organize files, clean readable code, sensible structure, balanced gameplay design, basically all new things for me. But things that would get me to develop good habits so that when I moved on to a larger project that I actually cared about, I wouldn't get caught up in a mess of spaghetti code and hamper my efficiency too early on. My master plan was this, wake up every day before school and work on it for at least half an hour. I'd finish the project by the end of January, upload it to itch, make a video log about my experience using Godot, and move on, possibly switching back to Unity. Simple and achievable, so I created my new project in Godot. I had already figured out player movement from another project the week prior, so I started with the juicer bot, the OG enemy with code that boiled down to, see the pineapple? Go that way! But translating this posed a greater challenge, because I had no idea how to use Godot's 3D physics. Or Godot's 3D. Or Godot. It took weeks to get the enemy behavior working. Weeks of trying, weeks of crying, weeks of googling. On days when I arrived at school early, my friends would come into the library to see what I was doing, and I'd say, Oh, I'm trying to make this box move, it's very difficult. I eventually figured out a solution that I was happy with, and moved on to other things. The benefit of spending all that time on enemy movement was that I now had a better understanding of Godot's physics. Weirdly enough, this was probably my biggest hurdle when starting development, but things really began to speed up once I had re-imported all of the original assets. But I still had plenty of issues to deal with. Colliders not detecting other colliders, materials not displaying correctly, the default audio system sounding horrible, the screen not scaling how I wanted. I had to learn how to use JSON files to save data. I had to figure out Godot's control nodes to get a menu working. Basically, I had to deal with all that mumble jumbo that comes with learning a new game engine. Half an hour a day, almost every day, I'd sit down and struggle with another basic problem and come up with another hacky solution. I tried to keep my code organized at first, but pretty much gave up in favor of just making it work. Every problem I encountered made me feel like an idiot. I felt stupid for even trying to learn Godot in the first place. Many times I wanted to quit, but I didn't. And in hindsight, I'm really glad I made my goal use Godot for 100 hours instead of use Godot forever, because knowing that I only had to deal with it for so long before I could choose to go back reassured me that my suffering was temporary, even if I might eventually choose to prolong it. By early December, the game was practically finished. I had successfully remade the original game in Godot, and even improved it with a better difficulty curve and scoring system. Despite my doubts, I was becoming familiar with the program, and I wasn't feeling the urge to switch back. But perhaps I'd become too big for my own britches. My original vision plagued my mind like a prophecy, and foolishly, I believed that I could fulfill that prophecy on time. In early December, I knocked down the first domino by adding a level selector. I wanted a beach level, a space level, a jungle level, a city level. I wanted more enemies, a proper settings menu, a VR mode. By this point, I was 50 hours in, and clearly, I was in. This game really didn't need every feature on the planet. But I figured that if I'm gonna release this game, it's gotta be doing more than its predecessor. Yes, I had proven that I can make a game in Godot, but I hadn't really proven that I could take those concepts and build upon them to create a really feature-complete game with lots of variety and a nice layer of polish. So, I had a new goal for the game. Three extra levels, each with two distinct enemies and a full menu with settings and a scoreboard. And I wanted all of this done by the end of January. Simple enough, right? The second domino to fall was a palm tree that I made in a computer lab at school, and it became Barbed Beach Retreat. It has no barbs, but it definitely has beaches. This level was based on Sunshine Isles from Mario 64 DS, a lovely little beach. Most of my effort in this level and throughout the rest of the game was concentrated on the textures. Bright colors and crunchy pixels were my forte. The theme of the whole game was robots and fruits, so it better be colorful and it better be digital. Every texture went through several iterations to create the right contrast and feel. That warm, tropical feeling. Right from the title screen. This wasn't any old beach, this was an advertisement for the Bahamas. Then came the enemies. During some brief moment of lucid thought, I had set my maximum to two enemies per level. 
just given how little time I had left. This is the Seagullator, a pun on Terminator and Seagull. The internet is full of low poly birds, so I didn't have to reinvent the wheel by making this guy, but I definitely had some fun with its design. Programming its behavior, on the other hand, was a little trickier. The juicer bot is programmed to move forward until touching the pineapple, then attack. The teleturret is programmed to look at the pineapple, then attack. The bird is programmed to glide in from a random point off screen, drop a weapon over the pineapple, and fly off. I know it doesn't sound that difficult, but there were a lot of systems involved that I hadn't interacted with before. Random spawn location, rigid bodies without gravity, spawning sub-objects, changing directives, changing animations, activating a timer upon death. It was just a little bit more complex than what I was used to in every way, and getting it right definitely drained me of a few more valuable weeks. For the second enemy, I combined a blender and a crab and called it Blendapod. I pretty much just copy and pasted the code from the juicer bot and added a few extra lines to make it zigzag. The reason I did this is because I knew that crabs move sideways, but I really wanted the player to see them from the front. This was the compromise I made, and as a byproduct, they are now more difficult to shoot. While the development of the beach level appeared to be going smooth, I knew of a great problem on the horizon that I would soon have to solve. While testing the level, all I had to do was swap out the nodes in the scene, but if I wanted to seamlessly transition between the levels as I intended with the level selector, I would have to rework the core systems running the game. The game master, the settings node, the player, and every enemy relied on the game having only one level. And for those unfamiliar with Godot, that's a horrible, horrible way to structure your game. Objectively wrong, some may say. But that happens when you're learning a new tool. You use it wrong, and you pay for your mistakes later. I had to completely rearrange the internal structure of my game, and split it into several more disconnected, modular, self-reliant scripts. It took a lot of brain power and forum posts to figure it out, but I kind of did. Eventually, I realized that the process I'd created still wasn't very intuitive for building upon. In order for a level to work, it had to have references to the package in two different scripts, variables here, here, and here, player setup here, enemy rules here, and gameplay loop down yonder. A thousand different cables, a thousand different ports, and none of them really in any obvious location. Was it less likely to crash now? Yes, but it was also less likely to work. But the beach level was working, the whole game was working, and upon playing through both levels, I came across an even bigger fundamental problem. The game was getting too big for its own idea. And what I mean by that is that the game idea is simple. It's two enemies per level, one gun, no power-ups, and these were all constants. I wasn't planning on changing any of them because of time constraint. The game loop was good enough for a game jam, but it lacked that potential to be something greater, at least not without major changes to the main gameplay loop. But I didn't want to rework the whole gameplay loop. This game wasn't a passion project of mine, this was just a test for me to learn Godot. Despite this, I still felt compelled to build upon the game's framework and add more levels and features and things that boosted the game in an aesthetic way. But going from one level to another didn't make the core game itself any better. It was the same short game with a different environment and different enemies. After getting a high score on one level, I didn't feel any sort of urge to play the next level. It had very minimal replay value, which really isn't great for a high score game. February was only a month away, my deadline was approaching, but now I was in this awkward position where I'd promised myself I'd add all these fun artistic additions to the game, but I didn't care about the game itself. Getting to the end would require a pretty significant effort, for a pretty insignificant result. But reverting back to the build I had in early December felt like giving up, like I would be proving to myself that I wasn't capable of committing to a long-term project. This was when I took my first big break. Exams were coming up in school, and I put aside game development to focus on studying for the rest of the semester. I didn't return to the project until a month later. I was past my due date for finishing the game, and I was completely uninterested in continuing on a project that I knew was fundamentally flawed, and the code that awaited for me after a month of absence was nearly unreadable. But still, I couldn't convince myself to quit. I was out of school now, I had planned for my second semester to be completely empty, and I didn't want my first act as a person in the real world to be quitting something that I would put so much time into. I also hadn't uploaded to YouTube since September, so finishing this game and making my 100 hours of Godot video was my top priority. So I made a plan to complete the game in just two weeks. Take a while to guess how well that turned out. After tidying up some of the less functional parts of the beach level, I set my sights on the space level. I had a very specific idea for the design of the space station. Dark flooring, metal mesh, and a perimeter of caution stripes. I had the Mario Kart Wii remake of N64 Skyscraper in mind. I definitely had the most fun designing this level. Multiple floors, jetting hallways, a fancy ramp system, and various windows through decks. Cool as it may be, during gameplay you hardly get a chance to explore it. I think the sky texture really sells the space vibe. I'd actually created it in a computer design 
design class I took a few years prior. The two enemies of this level were Fruit Flyers and Nectar Rays, the first one being a little alien bug based on the critter from Galaga and I guess an ant, and the second being a combination of a UFO and a Juicer. The Fruit Flyers once again use the same code as the Juicer Bot, with the addition of it flying in a big loop before seeking out the pineapple. That's because my initial idea was to have about a dozen of them emerge from a spaceship and then start attacking you one by one, just like the attack patterns of Galaga. I scrapped it because I didn't really feel like coding it. Oh, correction. Coding it sounded fine, but I knew that fixing the inevitable bugs would take me well past my new deadline. The Nectar Ray borrows its flying code from the Seagulator, but pauses and plays an abduction animation once it's reached the pineapple. Development of this new level was going reasonably well, but once again, I paused development of the game. I was still trying to maintain a reasonable YouTube upload schedule, and it was becoming increasingly clear that this project was a larger bite than I could chew in the time I'd allotted. A lot happened during this period of time. I recorded a modding video with friends, and made a review of Game Builder Garage. Shortly thereafter, I joined a multi-week game jam and made a video on that. Then I decided to make a film with my friends, followed by another game jam. I finally finished editing the modding video from before, and by this point it was May. When I finally opened the project again, I was feeling even more estranged from the code I'd created. I wandered around the unfinished worlds, feeling completely lost and unmotivated. I had made three separate games since starting this project. Games that taught me a lot about Godot and game development in general, yet here I was, back in this tangle of code that I barely recognized. It was as if the project had been worked on by several different people with no way of communicating with one another. Weird syntax, inconsistent naming conventions, code repeated in multiple places that did the same thing but in vastly different ways that all relied on some other hidden piece of code, yet I had once called this code an improvement over something else. Still, I returned to work and tried to find my flow, but Smoothie Space Space was taking a ton of time to complete. The more code, assets, and systems I had, the harder it was to implement new ones without causing an influx of bugs. This is normal to some extent. Every game's development slows down the larger it gets, but all things considered, this wasn't a very large game. My largest yet? Sure, but the project had layers of stratum in its quality. It was a road paved with no foundation, bound to crumble after minimal use. And that's a pretty good metaphor. Though I hadn't finished the game, I felt confident enough about what I'd learned to write my script. 100 Hours of Godot, a 7,000 word review of the engine. It took me nearly a month to finish it, after which I was left with this game still on the to-do list. Once again, I thought about all the work I had done, and all the work I still had left to do, and whether or not it was worth it finishing a game I didn't care about just so that I could say that I stuck it through. Neither option seemed wrong to me anymore, but I think it was that curiosity that kept me going. The answer to the question, what if I finished? that lured me back in again. I was starting to get comments on my Godot review, critiquing my code and providing solutions and resources for many of my problems. I also watched Godot Tutorial's video series on using GDScript, and learned a lot about GDScript's features that I hadn't used before. And after all of this, I made a pretty drastic decision. One, to cure my near-end development limbo. I was going to refactor my code. All of it. And by golly did that take some time. I took a lot of advice from the comments. I made everything independent of other nodes, I made sure child nodes weren't controlling their parents, I used more signals, I used more functions, I used more lists, I took certain scripts that shared duplicate code and made a base class for them, I renamed variables for consistency, I reordered statements for clarity, I remade all the previous code but with the concepts, knowledge, and skills that I had learned since the beginning of the project. That's to say, it's still nowhere near perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better. And with my code in tip-top condition, development sped up immensely. I finished the game loop for smoothly space based, did a little bit of balancing, and started work on the final level. I started enjoying development again. The end was near, the code was clear, and I had a can of root beer. The idea for a jungle level had been there since the original game jam. I workshopped some ideas in paint, such as going down a poison river like in New Super Mario Bros. Wii, or circling an active volcano. But ultimately, I decided on a simple mound of earth with a circular river surrounding it. I had some very specific things that I wanted to include in this level. Number one was billboards. Billboards are objects that are always facing the camera. Generally, this is used to create a faux 3D effect with minimal geometry, like all of the trees and half the enemies in Mario 64, or the fog in Doom. Those are my two favorite examples for whatever reason. So I designed a couple different versions of treetops, the first based on the background trees from New Soup, and the second based on Animal Crossing. Number two was a piranha. I think this was my favorite critter to design. I really like scary fish in video games. 
So I designed this guy with a demonic face. I made an animation of it hopping up and down, chomping to add a little bit of silliness, stole the juicer bot code, adjusted some variables, and it was done. Something kind of sneaky that I don't think most people would notice is that the fish's hurt box doesn't follow the animation, it's just a stretched out capsule. So you don't have to worry about timing your shots with the animation. That's unlike the Blendapod that actually does physically move from side to side. Number three was a flat background texture. For some reason, I really love when distant background elements are just the Wizard of Oz style wall with a texture on it. It's the kind of thing you usually don't notice at a distance, but is really funny up close. It also does well at serving its main purpose of giving you the illusion of depth. And number four was a monkey. Following the theme of robotic enemies, I gave it the name Orangaclang before I even started. I didn't have a specific idea of what I wanted this enemy to look like, so I just kind of threw together some reference and winged it. That's how this guy ended up with absolutely massive arms. I textured it to resemble the Terminator and made a few animations. I also recorded some sounds for the monkey. <laughs> Probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. I was in the final stretch. The game had almost every feature I wanted. Had I finally justified the addition of new levels and features with interesting gameplay variety? No, not really. But I no longer cared. As far as I was concerned, the game was finished a long time ago. I was just making art and adding polish. I planned to make my own music for the game so that I could really call it my own or whatever, but I pretty quickly realized that my music production skills were nowhere near where they needed to be. So instead I went on YouTube's audio library where I'd gotten the music for the original game and found a few more songs that fit the atmosphere pretty well. All of them are made by the artist God Mode, so thank you God Mode. I was sprinting to complete this game, checking items off my list faster than Flash in a grocery store. And finally, there it was. The last item completed. The game was done. Was it the best it could be? No. Was it everything I'd aimed for? Yes, it was. I sent it to a couple friends to play and fixed a few more glitches that I noticed in their playthroughs. I made an itch page, uploaded the game, and declared it finished. It's a weird feeling finishing a game. It's something that seemed impossible when I was little. I've been making games for eight years, and it's only in the last two that I've actually finished them. At some point when I was younger, I set a goal for myself. Release a game before I turned 18. Doesn't have to be for profit, doesn't have to be a masterpiece, just has to be a finished product available for anyone to download. And for so long, even that seemed like an impossibility. It was only recently that I remembered that goal of mine and realized that I've already done it. I've released more than a dozen games, but I think in some way, I still felt like I had cheated. By doing a game jam, I had made and released a product for sure, but that lack of long-term commitment made it feel unearned to me. I had spent several weeks on a game before, I could do that. My problem was sticking with the game beyond that initial spark of inspiration. Somewhere along the line, I unconsciously set a new goal for myself, to release a game that I had spent a long time making. In total, I spent just 150 hours developing this game. That's not a lot, but it's the fact that I stuck with it after so many months and so many trials and tribulations that means so much to me. That despite losing my motivation so many times, I finished the game. I finished my game. That feeling that I can do something is nothing compared to the knowledge that I have done something. And I'm excited for whatever I decide to create next because I know I can make it happen. If you'd like to play the game, the link is below. Ciao for now.